Good evening, afternoon. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good night. I don't know what time it is for everybody, but... Uh, we uh, will get started here in just a minute. Ooh, how's everybody's day going today? Very busy. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Friday. It is a Friday. I uh, I actually started a new job today. It was my first full day in, so uh, I've been up since very early. But uh, I'm glad to be here with you guys, and uh, let's let's do a little bit of learning. So. Um, if you're new to the, if this is your first week here at the school, my name is James. I'm a uh, commercial pilot and uh, advanced ground instructor with the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, and my goal here is to give you guys a little bit of insight into what it takes to be a P1, as well as even, uh, this is a good introductory course to be a private pilot. Um, so let's get right into it. So today we're going to be talking about uh, weather services to follow up last week, or uh, the week before that when we did uh, weather. Uh, and this is going to be a little bit of a shorter presentation. There's not a lot of weather information you need to know as a private pilot. It's very basic and minimum, but uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask me while we're moving through. Uh, so we're going to talk about METARs, uh, TAFTs, PIREPs, and then we're going to talk about some of the tools that you can use uh, to get a better picture of the weather you're going to be flying through. So let's get into it right with uh, METARs. So... Throughout the world, everybody uses the same formatted textual weather um, or information to to get the weather at an airport. And this is what we call a METAR, as well as a TAF. And these are uh, part of an international weather reporting code. And, and METARs are basically at a weather station, and they're issued hourly, so they kind of give a, an up-to-date picture of the weather. And TAFs are forecasts, which are issued every six hours, and every six hours a new TAF will come out, and they'll issue um, updated weather for the upcoming 24 hours from the time it was issued. So a METAR stands for Meteorological Aerodrome Report, and a TAF stands for a Terminal Aerodrome Forecast, so they're kind of related to each other. So there's going to be a lot of information here, uh, and I've tried to color code it, but we'll walk through it together uh, and try to make sure you guys understand completely what we're looking at here. So let me grab my trusty pointer here. So what we have here at the top is a METAR, and it won't be color coded like this when you're reading it, but I've color coded it for our purposes just to kind of explain to you guys uh, the sections of a METAR. So the first section here is the airport identifier or the station identifier. So does anybody know what KIST is? What airport that is? It's a story at a regional, right? Yeah, right. So this is a METAR report or a weather report for Astoria Airport. And what's followed by that is the time. So the time issued here is broken down right here. So the time is issued uh, and the date is issued as uh, a number or a numerical digit, which indicates the day of the month followed by the time in 24-hour uh, format in uh, UTC or Zulu. So this is issued on the 20th day of the month, so today, at 1953 Zulu. So this was a little bit earlier today. Uh, it wasn't actually. I just made all this up. But just to give you guys an idea, this would have been issued earlier today. Uh, if I had to guess, probably about f five hours ago? No, 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 no. Three hours ago. So, uh, followed by that is you have this orange section here, and that's actually the wind. So the wind is indicated here uh, with the first three numbers. That's your wind direction. It's coming from 240, or the southwest, followed by the speed. And so the speed here is 15. Now, in some cases, you'll actually have wind gusts, and the way that'll be indicated is you'll have the direction and speed followed with a G, and then the highest uh, measured wind gust. So in this case, I said 20 knots. So we have 24015G20. So the wind's 240 degrees at 15 knots, gusting to 20. The next part of a METAR report will typically be the visibility. So in this case, in this METAR, the visibility is three quarters statute miles. 
In this case, this is actually giving us a runway visual range indication, which is uh, the distance that you can see down a runway measured in feet. So this says here for R, runway 28, the runway visual range is 2,400 feet. So that means if you're at the beginning of the runway or any point of the runway, you should be able to see 2,400 feet down it. The fourth, or I'm sorry, the fifth part of the METAR is any kind of specific weather that they are reporting. So in this case, if we look down at our key here, uh, the plus sign means heavy intensity. So we know that uh, we have some kind of heavy precipitation or weather phenomenon. The TS in this case means thunderstorm. So we have a heavy or extreme thunderstorm. The RA means rain. So we have heavy thunderstorm or rain. And we can determine that means we have a heavy thunderstorm or rain in the vicinity of the airport or, or over the airport. The next section, which we have indicated here in Cyan, is the uh, cloud cover. So right here, this says BKN008 or OVC015CB. So what that translates to is you have broken clouds, that's what BKN means, at 800 feet. Well, you might be thinking, well, how do I get that 800 feet? All of these digits are indicated in hundreds of feet. So if you see just an 8, it's 800 feet. If you see a 1.5, it's 1,500 feet or 1,500 feet. So we can follow from the lowest layer. You have broken clouds at 800, overcast clouds at 1,500. And the CB at the end of this indicates that they are associated with cumulonimbus or, or a thunderstorm cloud. And like I said before, clouds are issued in hundreds of feet. Any questions so far? Okay, so as we continue here in dark blue, we have the temperature and dew point. As we talked about last week, temperature and dew point relate to each other. They uh, basically gauge uh, the relative humidity of the air, um, or dew point is the temperature at which this must be cooled to to reach 100% relative humidity. So it's followed by first temperature, then dew point. So we know the temperature is 2, 6 degrees Celsius, and the dew point is 2, 5 degrees Celsius. Indicated here in purple is the altimeter. It's indicated in the U.S. in inches of mercury. If you look at a weather report or METAR from like the U.K., it'll typically be in hectopascals. So here it's 29.85 inches of mercury. Indicated here in pink, uh, we have some remarks. So the remarks are similar to the specific weather. So we see that TS, so it's thunderstorm. The B indicates that it began at 32 minutes past the hour. So this was issued at 1953. The thunderstorm began at 1932. Uh, and it indicates that the rain began at 1932. So if it were if it was a B here, we can uh, we know that the thunderstorm began at 1932. However, if that was an E as an echo instead of B as in Bravo, that would be uh, ended. So if this said TSE at 32, we could say, hey, the thunderstorm ended at 1932. Does that make sense to everybody? It does. Okay. So I'm not going to go over all the abbreviations. If you'd like to find all the abbreviations that you can see in METARs, like TSRA, uh, there's BR, which is for mist, there's um, FG for fog, uh, HZ for haze, and then there's a bunch of other stuff, FU for smoke. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff. You can find that at this website or just Google METAR abbreviations and that will pop up for you. So let's talk about TAFs now. So TAFs are actually in the same format as METARs, um, but they don't include as much information. Uh, so a TAF is a concise statement of the expected weather conditions at an airport uh, for a specified period. It's typically 24 hours. And like I said, TAFs use that same code. So here we go. So we have the identifier. We're at Astoria. Now here's what's different. So this was issued on the 19th day of the month, so yesterday, at 1747 Zulu, followed by the active or valid time. So this report is valid from the... Um, oh, okay, that's my bad. I actually didn't edit this correctly. Uh, this should be a 20. But this is valid from the 20th at 1800 Zulu to the 21st at 1800 Zulu. So that's when we say that valid time or the specified period is determined here. And that's that 24-hour period. Now, the first line 
gives you a general indication of what the conditions will be like over that 24-hour period. Uh, so it's saying over that 24-hour period, you can expect a wind 210 at 17 knots, gusting to 24 knots. Uh, the visibility is greater, the P means plus, or greater than, 6 statute miles. And then followed by the uh, average cloud cover over that 24-hour period is few at 4,000, few at 15,000, scattered 25,000. Now the following lines below here are going more into detail about what you can expect at certain times. So the FM stands for from, and it's saying from the 20th day of the month at 2300 Zulu, you can expect this weather. F uh, the next line, from the 21st day of the month at f uh, 0500 Zulu, you can expect these weather conditions. And then from the 21st at 1400 Zulu, you can expect these weather conditions. So a TAF at some airports might be even longer than this. You might get shorter intervals uh, of updates. But it's very similar to a METAR. You just have to realize that each line is indicating a different time period. However, the report is valid for the time indicated here on the first line. Any questions about TAFs? Uh, sure, Edward. What's, uh, what's up? Uh, reminder that the uh, winds are given in true Yeah, we're going to talk about that later towards the end. Uh, I have a whole a whole thing set up for that. Actually, it's right here. Uh, so one thing to remember is all printed weather reports like uh, METARs and TAFs and winds aloft forecasts measure wind direction in true direction, so true heading. For some purposes, however, like if you're doing a nav log, you may need to convert these to magnetic direction, which is what you use in your airplane. Uh, and here's what you do. So what you do is you take the magnetic variation of the area in which you're in and you apply it to the wind direction. So magnetic variation is uh, the difference between true north and magnetic north. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field is not perfectly aligned with true north or 90 degrees on its axis. Um, so we have these magnetic variation lines here on the sectional that tell us how to uh, adjust from true heading to magnetic heading. Uh, and so I have an example here on the next slide. So at Astoria, the magnetic variation is indicated 15 degrees, 30 minutes east. And that's indicated with, uh, with this magenta line here. So what we do to find the magnetic wind direction is let's round that up to 16 degrees just for our uh, mathematic purposes. And because it's an easterly variation, we're going to subtract that from our true heading, which is given to us in our METAR tab. So if we look here at this partial METAR, we see the wind's 240 at 15. So the true direction, 240 degrees minus the 16 degrees, that would mean that the wind in magnetic direction or heading is from 224 degrees at 15 knots. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's how we can convert back to magnetic. All right, let's talk about PI reps. Um, you won't really see these as much in the simulator or for VATSIM. Uh, you can give them. I'm sure they'll gladly take them as a controller. Um, but if you're unsure of what the weather conditions are like in the sim and, and you're not really too sure, you can go to the FAA's database and see what actual pilots are reporting for weather uh, and, see, and, and see what you can kind of expect. So, aircraft in flight are the only means of directly observing cloud tops, icing, and uh, turbulence. Therefore, no observation is more timely than one made from the, con uh, the cockpit. And that's why uh, the FAA loves to talk about how great pie reps are. The FAA encourages pilots to report in-flight weather. Uh, however, if there is weather which you can see which was not forecasted, you are required by law to report that. Again... Not really necessary for VATSIM, but I figured that's something uh, interesting that you guys can know. Now, a PIREP can be identified by uh, two different symbols. It can be identified by either UA, which stands for Routine Report. Don't ask me why. I didn't make up the acronym for it. Or UUA, which stands for Urgent Report, or something that you know they really want you to, to, uh, to see, or a pilot really wants you to see. And it's usually transmitted in a prescribed format. So this is an example of a pyrop. Again, I have it nicely color decoded for you. 
Uh, and uh, the UA here indicates that this is a routine report. UA indicates urgent. Now, first in red, we have the location. So OV, we're going to be over Oklahoma City, and we're en route to Tulsa. That's what these two airports. So from en route from Oklahoma City to Tulsa. Here in orange, indicated is the time, 1800 Zulu. The altitude, so 12,000 feet. The type of aircraft, so this was uh, issued by a Beechcraft King Air 90, followed by the sky condition. So there's multiple layers here, and you may see that. So the first layer from the bottom is broken eight, it's a broken layer, 1,800 feet, and it tops out at 5,500 feet. So you can expect to be in the clouds from 1,800 to 5,500 feet. Then it should be clear, followed by another layer uh, that would be overcast or just basically a solid cloud layer from 7,200 feet or 7,200 feet, to 8,900 feet. And the pilot then states that it is clear above that altitude. It's clear sky. After the cloud uh, layers, you have the temperature, which is issued. It is uh, minus 7 degrees Celsius, and that's what the M stands for. Followed by the wind velocity and direction. So the wind direction is 080 at 21 knots. Followed by turbulence. So this pilot indicated that there is light turbulence from 5,500 feet to 7,200 feet. And the last and final section is the icing section. This pilot indicated that there is light to moderate rhyme from 7,200 feet to 8,900 feet. And <clears throat> that's kind of um, something that we could conclude by looking at the temperature here. It's minus 7 degrees. And there's a cloud layer here. So there's visible moisture and it's below freezing. So that kind of makes sense that we're getting icing. Uh, but any questions about pilot, pilot reports? So how is this data normally collected? Is there some form the pilot uses as he's climbing? Um, typically, the air, air traffic controller will input all this data. Um, so, you, you know, if I'm filing a PIREP, sometimes they'll ask me, sometimes I'll just submit it. Uh, what you'll do is, hey, uh, air traffic control or approach, I've got a PIREP for you, and they'll just say, go ahead. And uh, typically, they'll know where you are if you're talking to them. So, you don't, I, I, I've never given a location. Uh, but sometimes you can just say, like, oh, I'm five north of this VOR. Um, you don't have to give them the time. They'll have that. I'll give my altitude. And I'll just say, hey, uh, the cloud base was at 1,800 feet, topped out at 5,500. It's clear above. The temperature is 5 degrees. Uh, if I'm not equipped for a wind velocity, I won't give that. Uh, I'll say, you know, maybe there's some light turbulence or, uh, you know, I'm picking up some light icing from this altitude, this, uh, this altitude. Uh, but try to follow just in order, you know, location, time, altitude, and then give, like, the specific weather. Because he's going to be inputting it into a computer system that's going to kind of follow this order. Okay, so he can supplement things that he has that you may not give. Exactly, exactly. And not not every pilot report will contain all of these fields. Um, like the time will obviously be there, uh, but he, you know, uh, the altitude will usually be there. And if you miss something more often than not, they'll ask you for extra information. Okay, thanks. No problem. So let's talk about a, uh, I'm not going to go too in-depth with this tool, but uh, if you're, you know, you can research this at your heart's desire. Um, the Graphical Forecast for Aviation is a tool available on aviationweather.gov. Uh, and if you're doing a lot of domestic flying in the U.S., uh, you will be with VATSTAR, I'm assuming. Uh, you can get a lot of great weather information that uh, is supplemented to you graphically. Uh, and this provides continuously updated observes, so real-time, as well as forecast weather over the uh, continental United States, so the lower 48, as uh, they may refer to it. Uh, and this actually, I found out, actually gives information elsewhere. Like you see here, it has Canada, Mexico, uh, down here in the Caribbean. And I actually took it over to Japan, uh, I, and I guess because we kind of built their aviation system that uh, <clears throat> we support their data. But uh, I won't go too depth into this, but it's something that you guys can uh, look up, aviationweather.gov slash GFA or go Foxtrot Alpha. Uh, and you can explore that. There's hundreds or, or you know hundreds of options that you can go over. Clouds, uh, ceilings, thunderstorms, winds, turbulence, icing, stuff like that. So let's talk about winds and temperatures of law forecast. Again, you can find these at aviationweather.gov. 
go to uh, forecasts uh, and click winds and temperatures aloft and that will bring you here. So the winds and temperatures aloft forecast is displayed in a six digit format. It shows wind direction, velocity, and the temperature for certain altitudes. If you look at the top here of the forecast, we have a range of altitudes, and this is giving us the winds and temperatures for certain altitudes. It gives us a valid time. It gives us a time at which we can use it. And it also tells us that all temperatures are negative above 24,000 feet, or flat level 240. Uh, so you see that they won't be indicated with a minus sign here. They're just automatically assumed to be negative. Uh, I just realized <laughs> that this is, uh, I wrote this twice. Uh, but for example, uh, seven, oh, okay, I know what I did wrong there. Uh, I was explaining that, uh, or I'll just explain it to you. So uh, the first two digits indicate the direction. So if we have um, Astoria, right? So let's look at Astoria at 6,000 feet here. So we'll come down. Astoria, the wind is at 250 degrees. The second two digits indicate the speed, so 23 knots. And the final two digits indicate the temperature. So we have a minus sign here, so we know it's minus 4 degrees at 6,000 feet. Does that kind of uh, make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay. So next up, uh, if the winds are light and variable, there's actually a code for that. So the winds are light and variable, so they're changing direction. They don't really have an effect. That's indicated by a 9900 on the winds of law forecast. So I've circled one here for you. Uh, so the winds are light and burial at Ontario uh, at 6,000 feet, and it's 13 degrees. Now, what I meant to write here but didn't pop up uh, is I was telling you guys or I was going to explain to you guys uh, what happens if the wind speed is greater than 100 knots. So if the wind speed is greater than 100 knots, what happens is they actually take the direction uh, and they add 50 to indicate that the wind speed is more than 100 knots. So if you look here, what I uh, circled here in red, this says 76 as the direction. Well, that doesn't make sense. There's nothing that's, you know, 760 degrees on a compass rose. So the reason they add 50 is to indicate to you that the wind speed is greater than 100 knots. So the wind speed here is indicated with a 02. Well, that doesn't make sense. So 7602, that doesn't really make sense. So what they're telling us is the wind is at 102 knots. So we add 100 here to the speed, so we know it's 102 knots, and we subtract 50 from the direction. So, um, you know, if somebody wants to give this a shot, we see that 7.6 is the direction. If we have to subtract 50 to find the real direction, what do you guys think the direction is here that the wind is coming from? 26. Right, so 260 degrees, and what is the speed? 102. Okay, and the temperature isn't 51 degrees. It's actually negative 51 because we're above 24,000 feet. Um, just to make sure you guys get this 100%, uh, let's find another one here. Actually, there's only like a couple it all, of them. It's all in knots. It's all in knots, yep. Uh, I'm just trying to find another. Okay, so try, try this one here at the bottom. So right underneath it, what do you guys, when do you guys want to give this a shot? 26. Uh, 260 degrees at 101 knots. Right, and minus 50 degrees. All right, awesome. Uh, cool. So, yeah. So, this is how to decode it. If you had 734502, that would decode as 230 degrees true north, uh, or, I'm sorry, true heading, at 145 knots, and the temperature is 2 degrees Celsius. Okay, all right. Any questions about that? Nope. All right, cool. So let's talk a little bit about in-flight weather advisories. Now, you won't always get these in-flight. They're also published on the ground. You can get them pre-flight. Uh, but uh, typically, flight service will provide these to you. Uh, convective Sigmets Air Traffic Control will provide to you. Uh, but in-flight weather advisories uh, advise en route pilots of the possibility of hazardous flying conditions that might not have been forecast at the time of uh, your weather briefing. So airmets are uh, like general advisories that are given mainly to VFR pilots. They're not as so much applicable to instrument pilots, but um, 
they, they typically advise uh, icing, uh, widespread icing over a large area, widespread turbulence over a large area, or uh, widespread uh, like IFR areas, or, ma- or what they refer to as mountain obscurement. Um, SIGMETs, and it's in the name, SIG stands for significant, MET stands for meteorological, so you have significant meteorological conditions. And this advises of weather which is potentially hazardous not just to VFR pilots or VFR aircraft, but to all aircraft, IFR aircraft, airliners, um, business jets, everybody. Uh, And the items that are covered in this are severe icing over a widespread area, severe or extreme turbulence, widespread sandstorms, dust storms, volcanic ash, like let's say Mount St. Helens finally blew up or something like that. Uh, You would probably see a sigmet about that. And finally, uh, you have convective sigmets. And convective means, well, we talked about convective in the weather lesson. What do you guys think convective means? Well, that's when uh, heat causes the air to rise. Right, exactly. You have a lot of vertical motion in the atmosphere. And if we go back to our weather thing, what does a lot of vertical motion in the atmosphere cause? Do you guys take a guess? Turbulence. Um, Turbulence, yep. Uh, what else do we get with? Uh, th- think, think. What's a big, significant weather hazard to aircraft? Thunderstorm. Thunderstorms, exactly. So a thunderstorm is an example of a convective um, weather pattern, right? You have air going up and down very quickly, and uh, unstable air, which is creating a thunderstorm. So when we think things are convective, we think wind shear, thunderstorms, tornadoes, uh, things like that. Uh, so that's what convective sigmets cover. They issue um, possible warnings and advisories for thunderstorms, tornadoes, uh, embedded thunderstorms, which are thunderstorms within a large area of clouds. They'll imply severe or great turbulence, so super severe icing, low-level wind shear. Um, but like we said, when a, uh, this is just saying at the bottom, when a sigmet forecasts embedded thunderstorms, it's just indicating that thunderstorms are obscured by clouds and you can't see them, so they're just trying to let people know. Uh what's going on uh, within a large cloud pattern. So we talked about air mets, which are those kind of advisories to VFR pilots, but also just to everybody kind of let you know what's going on. And this is what air mets look like on a map here at the bottom. This is from the uh, aviationweather.gov at the air mets section. Uh, and you see that these air mets, if you follow the lines, these cover like, you know, half the United States sometimes. And you see there's all the different ty- types here. So this one here in blue, is icing, the orange ones are turbulence, and then the red ones are IFR areas, or like areas where it's forecast to be uh, IFR, which is cloud ceilings less than a thousand feet and visibility less than three statute miles. And these each have their own uh, identifier. So an Aramet Sierra uh, indicates those widespread IFR areas, which is again that less than a thousand foot ceilings and or three mile uh, three miles of visibility over a wide area. So they're saying over 50% um, of the area that they're uh, quoting or, or I guess covering is uh, IFR. An Air Tango is issued for turbulence. So the way to remember it is T for turbulence, right? Uh, or sustained surface winds of 30 knots or greater. An Air Zulu is uh, for moderate icing or low freezing levels. So they're indicating that there's going to be icing or the temp- or the altitude at which freezing could begin uh, is very low. Any questions about air mets? Yes. No? Okay. All right. And finally, we'll just show you what sigmets and convective sigmets look like. Uh, and these are referred to as WS and WST. These can be found at this link, aviationweather.gov slash sigmet. And you see it covers South America, too. It's not just the U.S. Um, So everything here besides this blue one is a convective segment. So these are all convective segments for thunderstorms. They're issuing, hey, these are all areas where, you know, you might see thunderstorms or there are thunderstorms. This red one here is a convective segment for turbulence. So you can expect severe turbulence here. And that kind of makes sense because it looks like there might be some mountains here that could be causing that turbulence. The blue one here is just a regular sigmet, and that's a significant weather advisory just for some uh, pretty heavy to moderate icing uh, that everybody should know about. And this, if you were to click on this on the website, it would give you the altitudes, which you can find this at, uh, the temperatures, uh, and uh, the type of ice, which you may expect. 
Any questions about that, guys? Sounds good. All right. Well, I know this was a short one today, but uh, that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, we'll conclude now. If you guys want to ask any questions about anything you were confused about, uh, go ahead and uh, ask away. So I came in late, so I want to know how to go back and look at the uh, beginning of it. Sure. Uh, no, that's too early. Yeah, so we talked about METARs and TAFs, uh, which are... Um, Weather reporting codes, just very briefly, we went over how uh, they're decoded and things like that. But uh, if you want, you can rewatch this. This will be on YouTube in, uh, in, you know, two or three hours. And then we went over TAFs, which are very similar to METARs. Uh, we went over how to convert from uh, true to magnetic direction. Uh, and then we talked about pi reps, and then we basically. Would you mind for the pi reps, um, maybe do uh, like a sample script or how I would say I wanted to give a pi rep? Sure. Um, yeah, that's that's. I, I think I can do that. So typically, what we'll do is, um, you know, what, let me find like a. A good thing I can even send you. But typically what you'll do is uh, you'll, you'll follow the same format. So what you'll do is um, you'll follow. So let, let's just I'll, I'll think of one. So I'll say uh, approach um, VAT star one like to file a pirate and he'll read back VAT star one uh, stand by uh, one minute. He'll call me back. He'll be like, all right, Star one go ahead with the power-up. And also, I'll say this. I'll say, Star one two nautical miles south of the Astoria Airport. Uh, routine pirate. Uh, time is, uh, let's see, it's 531. Uh, 2231 Zulu. The altitude, 8,000 feet. Or we are a Cessna 172. Skies are clear. Like to report 10, nautical, uh, 10 statute miles visibility. No precipitation. Temperature five degrees Celsius, uh, and then you know if if you have turbulence, you would say uh, light to moderate turbulence or moderate to severe, severe icing, light to moderate rhyme or light rhyme if you have that, and then uh, remarks if you have anything else you'd like to say. You know some pilots like to be funny, and if you actually look at pyreps that are uploaded online uh, to the F uh, the aviationweather.gov website. There are some pyreps that are like, oh, the turbulence spilled my coffee, and they'll actually, you know, write that in. Um, right. But yeah, I, I'll, I'll even, uh, I'll, let's see, I'll actually pull this up if I can. Uh, okay, I'll just, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll post this in the uh, media channel. Uh, but yeah, it, typically you follow, you know, just location, time, your altitude, your type. Uh, and then anything weather pertinent that you'd like to let them know. Thank you. That was good. Well, I had a question about, um, I did my first um, IFR flight off of, uh, from Monterey to Concord. And it was like, wanted to know if I knew what the weather was. And um, if, you're, if you're asking for clearance to take off, are you supposed to be letting them know that you know what the weather conditions are? Uh, ju specific. You are you you're supposed to know the weather for the airport at which you are at before you call for clearance. You're supposed to have the ATIS. Um, but you are also it's required by law. You're supposed to have a full weather briefing uh, for every flight that you do. And how does that? What does that take? The, and how does that show up? Um, so weather briefings, again, they're not as critical for, um, for VATSIM. Uh, you can get a briefing online if you just Google standard weather briefing. Uh, they will be automatically generated for you. You'll put in your route and they'll give them to you. Uh, another good website you can use for that if you want to go that into depth for VATSIM. You can go to um, 1-800-WX-BRIEF make an account on there and you can make a, it'll give you like a, a weather briefing. Um, and I, I'm sure there are also some flight simulator tools for weather briefings. 
Uh, but that's just a good way to, to get it. But for an IFR flight, yeah, you're supposed to know uh, what to expect for the entire flight. And do you report that by just telling them you have uh, information? And I know it's like, if, is it designated at, from a particular time? I know that. Well, if you're at an airport that has a controller, they're going to have an ATIS issued and they're going to have like information Quebec. You're just going to say, you know, uh, picking up our IFR to uh, John F. Kennedy with Quebec and they'll know you have the weather. Quebec just, Quebec just tells them that you have the correct weather. Right, that you listen to the ATIS and you know what their, you know what the weather that they reported is. Okay, got it. Uh, does the whole training and ground school apply only for America or other parts of the world as well? Uh, most of this is rooted in um, the FAA, which again. It's not uh, unfamiliar with most parts of the world. A lot of these rules and things will cross over to other parts of the world. Um, so the METARs, again, are worldwide. TAFs are worldwide. Uh, each country has its own individual like uh, weather service for finding all this information. Uh, but for the purposes of this grad school, we're just looking at uh, America. For the winds aloft where you had values over 100 and you added 50... Does that 50 also get added to the temperature or do you keep the temperature normal? No, the temperature is normal. So that the only reason they add 50 is just to tell you that the wind speed is over 100 knots. So you're going to have to add 100 just to the wind speed and then subtract the 50 from the direction. Yeah, it's it's you know it's a learning curve, and um, if you have any more questions, you can always DM me, or if you know you want me to demonstrate something in the sim, we can do that privately, or you know do that separately from this. But uh, if uh, anybody have any more questions, oh, cool. What was your name? I'm James. Oh, James. Thanks. All right. Uh, I hope to see you guys next week. I think, uh, let me see what our lesson's on next week. I have it somewhere over here. Uh, let's see if you guys are interested. In the, let's see what kind of reaction I get. Uh, next week we are talking about aircraft performance, uh, I believe. Well, I thought we did, maybe I did this lesson already. I can't remember, actually. Uh... I guess, actually, we didn't do this lesson yet. I'm looking at it. So, all right, yeah, so next week, I guess we'll be doing aircraft performance. Uh, the week after that, we'll be doing uh, en route flight and, uh, you know, sectional charts and how to calculate time en route and stuff like that. Good. Hey, James, I, I did have a question. I yeah. did have a question for James. So, on the, on the um, uh, PTARs, yeah, or PREPs, I'm sorry, PREPs, um, it, it will show the, um, like the cloud cover, like broken 18, 1800 feet to 5,500 feet, but on the METARs, does it show that as well? Or does it just say where the bottom is? The, yeah. The METARs will only indicate the bottoms of each layer. It won't tell you if there's like a, it won't tell you if there's like a gap between them. Okay. Uh, so it won't, like, it won't tell you the thickness of the layer because that the technology just isn't able to do that. Uh, a pilot is able to say, hey, well, I entered the clouds at this altitude. I left the clouds at this altitude. I entered the clouds at this altitude. I left the clouds at this altitude. And, oh, it's clear above. You know, a, a, a laser can't do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the other question I had for you was what, um, when you're looking at the, um, I think it was the magnetic north versus um, true north, right? Yep. Um, on the GPS, what does it show? Does it show you magnetic or true? Uh, it depends. Uh, most GPSs are, I believe they can do both. Um, some GPSs will have a magnetometer and they can do magnetic. Um, some can do true, but typically I believe they just do ground track. Um, so I don't believe they actually show a specific heading. I'm going to actually double check that right now. Um, well, let's see. Yeah, I believe it just does ground track. And that's how it gets its heading. Um, so you could say true heading, I guess, because it, you might not necessarily be facing um, a certain direction. So I believe it calculates off a of ground track, yeah. 
Yeah, because it sometimes seems like my like my, the the my not magnetic compass, my, my I guess uh, indicating compass, I guess that's what it is. It it shows that's different than what's on the GPS. Yeah, because one one you're supposed to align that directional gyro with the magnetic compass, so that's supposed to be magnetic. Your GPS is simply indicating your ground track or the direction you're moving over the ground. Okay. Because you got to remember, if you have a crosswind, you're not going to be facing the direction you're moving. Okay, understood. All right, all right, guys. Uh, I will hope to see you all next week. I think that we'll have uh, some fun next week with aircraft performance. I'll maybe I'll get some of you guys to do some calculations and stuff like that. Uh, try to keep it interesting. But uh, right, I'll see you guys next week. Everybody, ha enjoy their weekend. Thanks, James. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.